Hello, everyone. Hello. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, welcome to all of you to the Tartu Grassroot event of Democracies Europe. Uh, my name is Stefano Braghiroli. I'm Associate Professor in European Studies and local organizer of the Democracy is Europe initiative. We have worked hard in these uh, not easy times to organize at the best of our possibilities this event in online format. And we are quite impressed by how many of you are joining the event. Uh, the event is organized by the Johann Schutte Institute of Political Studies in cooperation with the Union of European Federalists and supported by the European Commission. Uh, now, before moving on with um, some words from our side, I would like maybe to introduce some netiquette that has to do with the smooth management of this uh, event. Uh, Overall, I would recommend you to keep the microphone muted. That is extremely important for a nice and uh, fluid uh, event. Uh, possibly turn your camera uh, off during the panels, uh, but feel free to keep it on during the Q QA session. Uh, we advise you to set your name uh, in Zoom so we, we can see who you are. Uh, also, some screenshots will be taken during the webinar and during the and during the discussion. Um, the event is also recorded. Overall, when it comes to the panels, uh, questions can be posted via uh, the chat throughout all the event or just ask live during the QA part of the session. And now back to more uh, interesting uh, aspects. So in fact, uh, the Democracies Europe uh, project uh, co-funded by Europe for Citizens program of the European Union is aimed to raise awareness on the centrality of European ideals when it comes to the transitions and the peace peaceful revolutions between 89 and 91 in Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states and somehow to encourage debate and reflection on the impact of such ideas in today's Europe. Um, thanks to uh, a lot, thanks a lot. We really would like to thank the main coordinators of UF for making uh, all this event possible. But also I would like to introduce you some of their people that are making this event possible here from our virtual venue. Uh, Anna, uh, our manager for online learning uh, that is taking care somehow of the digital infrastructure and uh, has been doing a great job to make this work. And our two uh, volunteers, Sakina and Elvin, who uh, will be uh, precious and part of our uh, team tomorrow, and that will assist you uh, during the group work and during the interactive session that will take place tomorrow, starting from uh, 10, uh, 30 in the morning. Uh, now, uh, what do we do uh, in this event? This event is about remembering. This event is about celebrating. We celebrate the return to freedom, democracy, and independence in Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. And in fact, an important step toward the reunification of our continent. But we also know that celebrating and remembering is fundamental, but not enough. Um, we need to imagine, we need to realize, we need to be bold, especially in these uncertain times, times that are clearly uncertain. We don't know exactly uh, how uh, European integration is going to evolve. We don't know how, uh, which challenges we're gonna face in the next year and times of insecure insecurity. Um, again, Estonia and the Baltic states faced clearly and for sure uncertain and insecure times in the early 90s. And this spirit of insecurity and uncertainty is very well epitomized by the famous words, quite colorful, uh, of uh, uh, Leonard Mary, the first president of the newly free Estonia. Uh, I quote, uh, and allow me some French, the situation may be shit, but it's our fertilizer for the future. Um, 
from a completely different perspective, still in terms of uncertain and insecure times. The former president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, said a couple of years ago, the wind is back in Europe's sails. We now have a window of opportunity, but it will not stay open forever. And we know that, we, we see that every day. Now it's time to build a more united, a stronger, a more democratic Europe. We started to fix the roof, but now we must complete the job and as the sun is shining and while it still is. In a way, yes, we feel, especially in these times of uncertainty, the clock is ticking. And somehow in these very days, the conference on the future of Europe is opening. We ask you to be bold and we ask you to be inspired. And this is something that somehow will be more concrete also during the session that we will have tomorrow. Now, just one word or two before passing um, the ball to uh, the other two speakers from this welcoming session. One word or two about where we are. This is one of the many reasons why it's a great joy to have this event in Tartu, uh, in Estonia. Uh, it's an opportunity to make our and your voice heard. A voice that in fact is not often heard geographically because somehow Estonia is perceived sometimes to be at the outskirt of the European Union, at the borderline. And also our voice, uh, young people, people that somehow want to have their say, but feel that their voice is not heard. Um, but as you can see from this slide, uh, as we basically move through uh, from the events that have already taken place, through the Democracies Europe project framework, Germany, Hungary, Lithuania. Well, we see that our participants are pretty much from all over the world. Uh, in fact, the entire world meets here, also virtually. Now have a look, um, Colombia, Germany, Ghana, Netherlands, Egypt, Estonia, Italy, Lithuania, and so on and so forth. But of course, some might say, why? Why is it relevant for someone in China, Germany, Brazil, Russia to be involved? Well, first of all, because Estonia singing revolution is about hope and freedom and speaks to the world. And also because European integration is not only about institutions and politics, it's about ideas and aspirations that have no borders, no passports, no limits. And now Tartu, why Tartu? Now, it would be easy to say because in 2024, it will be European capital of culture. But Ernie, who will talk in a few minutes, will be able to say more about that. I just want to spend a moment to talk about our university and city as a multi-layered cake of history, uh, established by a Swedish king, Gustav Adolf, as the second oldest Swedish university, uh, at the time in which the language of science was Latin, Following the Nordic War, the University uh, of the Russian Empire, the only one with German as official language, and formed intellectual and political elites of so many countries from Latvia to Georgia. In 1919, it became eventually uh, the National University of Estonia. Today, it gathers students from more than 100 countries. Uh, in Soviet times, Tartu used to be a closed city where foreigners were allowed only exceptionally and were not allowed to stay overnight for most of the, in most of the cases. Today, one fifth of this population consists of students and the relevant portion of them are from all over the world. Uh, I think that this is probably the best reason to have you all here digitally and to invite you to our city once the exceptional times are behind us. Now, before passing the word to, uh, our representative from uh, uh, Union of European Federalists, I just would like to conclude to remind you about uh, the uh, Democracy is Europe uh, essay competition. Uh, our partners from Brussels will now share the link in the chat of the event and along with the Facebook form, uh, with a, sorry, with a feedback form that uh, will be enclosed as well related to uh, this event. Uh, now I'm very glad to pass the word to our uh, representative from the Union of European Federalists, uh, Wolfgang Wenbach. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope you all can see me. Um, my name is Wolfgang Wettach and I have the honor to speak on behalf of the Executive Bureau of the Union of European Federalists, uh, your organization which has also reason to celebrate this year because 75 years ago, 1946 in Paris, the Union of European Federalists was founded after earlier the same year, the Hertenstein Declaration, which also was the founding moment for the German branch of the organization where I hail from. Uh, what are the European Federalists? We are basically the organization of all pro-Europeans um, in Germany and all over Europe, inside and outside the EU. And we're very happy to uh, co-host this event in Tartu at the university. And I have to say, uh, while the founder of the university, uh, like Johannes Kütte, after whom this institute is named, was able to speak German. And as our host uh, just mentioned, German was an official language of the university for quite some time. I. Uh, I'm not able to speak Estonian, so I'll just greet you in English, which is the language for this talk. Um, you have several reasons to celebrate. But it says Aaron Gera. Yeah. <laughs> you have several reasons to celebrate this year. I mean, it's a uh, hundred years uh, ago that Estonia's independence was recognized and uh, Estonia joined the community of nations and Germany and Estonia started diplomatic relations like we did again 1991 when you regained your independence. For me, it's uh, exciting to see what you will come up with when it comes to resolutions and texts and to see what you made of the 30 years of independence, both democracy wise and stability and press freedom wise you're doing quite well on all the international indices. So where do you want to go? Which role will Estonia play? A country that is for 10 years now part of the Eurozone as well, um, and which has fixed borders for 10 years now as well after Putin finally signed a fixed uh, contract on the borders of Estonia. So where will Estonia's future be? What will be the future of uh, democracy in Estonia. I'm excited uh, to see what you come up with and happy to join you. And I wish everyone a good uh, day today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I'm very glad to leave the floor to uh, our last uh, uh, speaker for this uh, welcome session. Uh, Ernie Kesk, who is the program coordinator of Tartu 2024, European Capital of Culture. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, hey, it's Ernie. an honor. It's an honor to be here. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you can. Um, my name is Ernie Geisk and I'm the program coordinator of Tartu 2024, European Capital of Culture. Um, I guess for many of you, it's the news that uh, that Tartu, together with uh, Southern Estonia, will celebrate uh, the biggest cultural event in Europe. But uh, for us, it's the process which has been going on for many years and uh, joining really, really different uh, parties, different people, different communities, uh, as well in Tartu as, as, as in Southern Estonia and, and uh, Europe-wide. Uh, indeed, those who are not aware of what is the European capital of culture is, it's the initiative which started in uh, 1985 by Melina Mercuri uh, 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 back then and, and Jack Lang and, and it has been really really he healthy and, and a working model for, for uh, celebrating uh, uh, European uh, diversity and then Tartu after a long long uh, uh, and, and very equal uh, competition has, has won the chance to, to host uh, this um, these uh, uh, projects. And um, of course, naturally, each and every one of you who are not currently in, uh, in Tartu or Southern Estonia are welcome to, to Tartu in 2024, 
when actually Estonia will celebrate its 20th anniversary of joining the EU, which is a very, very big uh, celebration for us. Uh, but, um, but practically widespoken, it will be the, it will be the, uh, we would say, the biggest uh, uh, transversal cooperation project between Tartu and Southern Estonian uh, uh, municipalities. And then definitely uh, we're working on a plan to make it uh, the biggest cultural event in 2024. Um, and actually the European Capital of Culture has started, uh, uh, the journey has started and, uh, and the title year will be just the celebration of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this uh, event. Um, and um, I, I'm really sure that, that many of you will be uh, among those people that we expect here to Tartu and Southern in Estonia around 1 million visits at that year. And uh, uh, naturally, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, let's keep all the fingers crossed that uh, the situation that has been uh, uh, you know, uh, disturbing us for some time uh, already will be over uh, by then. I'm wishing you uh, um, uh, really nice uh, days ahead today and tomorrow. Um, and I'm welcoming you back, uh, if not earlier than in 2024 to Tartu. And, uh, and uh, remember that all the great things that will happen in uh, Estonia in 2024 will certainly happen in Tartu. So thank you, Stefano. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy uh, your discussions. Thank you, Ernie. And uh, uh, one thing just, uh, as far as I know, the, uh, the project uh, out of which Tartu applied for the, the European Capital of Culture is the Art of Survivor, right? It's, uh, indeed, indeed. So that's very much about the, relates to the history of the city and to this uh, kind of struggle to reemerge. Absolutely, absolutely. Tartu, as the, as the oldest city in the Baltics, uh, has got a commitment to, to prove how to how to be sustainable in, in every meaning of, of life. It's not just about culture, but we really try to broaden the concept of, of, of culture through this event. And it could be a good catalyst for, for the change which is needed for uh, middle-sized uh, cities like Tartu East in Europe, uh, together with the partners in Europe. And, uh, and the University of Tartu is a good example of, of, of this, this kind of uh, survival uh, you know, instinct over, over here. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks again. Uh, and uh, now I think that uh, we can ask to our speakers for the panels to uh, sit. And then I pass the word to our moderator for this panel, Andrei Makarichev. Yes. Mute off. Yes. Dear friends and uh, colleagues, it's uh, my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, the panel uh, this uh, discussion. And the panel is about the idea of your design competition. Uh, one. We can't actually hear you yet. Okay, I continue with a different uh, microphone, so we are well prepared for any uh, <laughs> any emergency situations. Is it better now? Should be. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, we have three uh, speakers. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Hikopabo, who is lecturer of, in the politics of Baltic Sea region uh, countries at the University of Tartu. Uh, then uh, I'll give floor to uh, Stefano Bragiroli, uh, who has already introduced himself and the whole institute. And uh, then I will give uh, floor to uh, Dr. David uh, Beecher, who is uh, expatriate Estonian visiting professor here at the University of Tartu and also uh, uh, affiliated with the um, University uh, of um, California in Berkeley. So, uh, Heiko, the floor is yours. 
Okay, so hello everybody. It's uh, nice to greet you behind the, the screen. <laughs> uh, our group here is, uh, is, is more, and I hope that you don't mind if I'm sitting here because we plan it more as, as a round table and discussion, not, not so much as a, as a classical presentation. I was asked to provide this kind of uh, brief insight uh, for Estonian uh, process of regaining independence and then its uh, connections with uh, with Europe and then later already Stefano and uh, David will provide more global in Estonia then um, probably there would be two uh, two starting points and on one hand uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, Estonia and two other Baltic states were uh, the, the only countries in uh, Europe that uh, this is, is not correct uh, corrected. Uh, that was one of the uh, uh, guiding uh, line in, in this uh, process. On the other hand, uh, we also have to keep in mind that there was almost uh, 50 years uh, experience of, uh, uh, of Soviet era. And, uh, and when the struggle started that led to the uh, restoring independence, then it definitely was not immediately the ultimate goal or, or aim to define. Uh, this panel is uh, setting the focus on the period when uh, the uh, will uh, of uh, restoring independence was more uh, loudly uh, pronounced, but uh, in the beginning it started more as an environmentalist struggle. Uh, there were a lot of uh, issues uh, regarding of ethnic uh, topics because in the soviet union there was a friendship of the nations uh, in in uh, rhetorical terms but reality uh, what we saw it was that the soviet union really didn't bother uh, so much dealing with with the integration of different ethnicities it was more to to form the homo sovieticus uh, person who speaks in russian subscribe to this kind of way uh, socialist uh, uh, authoritarian uh, idols and uh, and and uh, so on uh, uh, that this um, uh, ethnic struggle was definitely also the case in Estonia like also in Latvia the, the share of uh, Estonians or Latvians it was constantly uh, decreasing and the fear that uh, the nation reminds this kind of minority in in their own uh, republic was was quite uh, quite serious and and that was also one uh, one aspect and of course the the third pillar there was also this kind of um, socioeconomic um, aspect and then here uh, Estonia, which on one hand we had uh, probably David will speak more about the exile Estonian communities, uh, and their role, but Estonia had this kind of window to uh, to the Western world. So that one hand, yes, there were these exile Estonians who could come here, who could tell the stories what's going on also uh, beyond the uh, Iron Curtain. But the also very important aspect, and maybe what influenced even more, was was Finland and uh, the Finnish television. Uh, this was definitely one factor that uh, triggered Estonians to, to drive towards uh, better socioeconomic conditions. Uh, we were able to see that how it's possible to, to live in a capitalist system, which is much better than, than what the people saw uh, in, uh, in the Soviet propaganda. Uh, and uh, even, for example, Mario Lauristin, uh, our one of uh, grand old lady of, of our uh, social sciences and, and also the activist uh, during the uh, restoration of independence, she said uh, that uh, uh, this connection with the uh, truth of Finnish television uh, 
gave us this kind of driver, what we don't have and where we would like to go. Yes, there was uh, definitely very important this, this uh, socioeconomic dimension, but at the same time, the interaction with, with Finns, because Finns were considered in the limbo, so that they were not fully West, but they also definitely were not, uh, not the East. Uh, and then through the kinship uh, with, with uh, Finns, uh, this cultural kinship what we have, uh, this allowed Finns to come more often here and then also to, to influence, to bring this kind of uh, uh, more democratic thinking, uh, more liberal ideas to uh, our local intellectuals as well. Uh, so that uh, this uh, window uh, certainly played a very, very important uh, role in this, uh, this, this process. And uh, when we speak about the year nine, uh, 1989, what is the, uh, the starting point of, of this, uh, this, this panel, uh, then uh, we definitely, this is the year when there was uh, the sad commemoration day for, for the three Baltic nations. Uh, the world famous uh, Baltic Way was, was organized. Uh, where Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians uh, were standing in the uh, human chain from Tallinn to Vilnius and then trying to bring the attention, international attention, to this historical injustice that we have felt. And this is also uh, what I wanted to say that even though maybe the starting point was ecological or ethnic or, 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 or socioeconomic aspects, but uh, by this time already, this kind of uh, idea that there has been historical injustice. There is a lot of family stories. What what has been uh, told and 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 spread and kept alive. That we should now move on. Uh, we should find the uh, recognition because that time Soviet Union still did not recognize the existence of Molotov Ribbentrop uh, secret protocols. Uh, that was the starting point of of the Baltic occupation, Soviet occupation and uh, to bring international attention on, on, on this, this topic. And then also to put the pressure on, on the Soviet Union, because that time the, the, in, in the Soviet Union, the, the Supreme Council has made the committee to investigate, was it really so, or is it only the Western propaganda? Because in, in the West, everybody could see this, this, uh, these documents, but, but in the Soviet Union, they did not bother to go to the archive and then and, take and <laughs> out these documents. <laughs> Uh, so that they they were uh, trying to 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 play around, uh, but uh, after this eighty nine, we we also can see that uh, this this dynamics what in uh, in the in the Baltic states has been said that uh, this is also the period where it's the transition where until then Estonia was kind of leading the the process that the struggle towards. Uh, uh, as though in, uh, towards the uh, independence, uh, then Lithuania uh, took it over, and then the, the, this kind of pro-independence forces uh, took uh, more uh, stronger ground in uh, in uh, in Lithuania, and Lithuania started to to push the, this border because until then Estonia was constantly pushing this this border, checking that uh, what. Kremlin, what Moscow is, is doing if we make this or other 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 decision. Uh, and uh, and though unlike uh, Lithuania, Estonia and Latvia, they both uh, also had this kind of quite strong, uh, we call it this kind of imperialist uh, or, or pro-imperialist uh, movement, anti-independence uh, movement uh, directed also from, uh, from Kremlin this inter interfront uh, movement and this also embedded this uh, uh, this this drive in uh, uh, in in Estonia and then slowly but but steadily over over the the years we could see that how uh, the elections so to uh, Soviet uh, Supreme Council in uh, Estonia but also in the other Baltic states were, was uh, uh, overwhelmingly won by the reformist forces uh, so that uh, they gave quite a strong support also to, to Gorbachev who was still trying to push this, these reforms in, in the Soviet Union uh, and uh, in the shadow of 
of these uh, Soviet uh, reforms, we, we could also uh, see that how this idea was was pawning that we, we should actually restore this independence. Because in 87, when everything started, no one could even think that Soviet Union becomes so weak and then and, and will we'll let the, the Baltic uh, states to, to uh, restore their independence. But uh, in, in 89, when it was already visible that at least the uh, Soviet satellite uh, countries, they could go their own way. So this uh, Sinatra doctrine, the famous Sinatra doctrine by, by Gorbachev, uh, this uh, gave some, some hope that maybe it's, it's, it's possible. And uh, in the 1990, then as I already said, that Lithuania took uh, this, this bigger initiative. Uh, Lithuania already declared uh, the restoration of, of its independence, but that time Lithuania remained alone and then had to face the uh, uh, sanctions, economic sanctions from, from Kremlin. And, uh, and uh, the decision was forced to, to, to postpone. Uh, the implementation of, of this. And, uh, and then Estonia and Latvia, they also took during 1990 this, uh, this decision that yes, it's clear one day uh, we will restore this independence, but, uh, uh, but that's, that's not, uh, not yet the moment. <laughs> but uh, uh, even though if it started more as a grassroots uh, initiative, then um, uh, this, this kind of European idea and then this idea that we should restore our place on, on European map uh, that uh, definitely also also emerged uh, there. And, uh, and if maybe not so much during this process uh, it was emphasized, but then the following, the, the 90s, what also Stefano uh, mentioned, this kind of very turbulent period here uh, during the 90s, it was uh, definitely constantly by the political elite. It was constantly reminded so that we are returning to our home Europe, uh, our like a stolen home, so that we were taken away from from this 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 home, and then we would like to uh, become uh, part of it. So maybe I stop it here, and uh, then I'm open for the question later. Thanks, Lasiko, for sharing your um, uh, your uh, your ideas about this uh, turbulent period. And now, Stefano, the floor is yours. You have your own microphone, right? Yes, okay. I am. Uh, I'm microphoned. Uh, yes, and and I think I will start from this point that just uh, Eko mentioned before concluding this uh, talk. Return to Europe. And this is where I will focus on mostly, and uh, let's say the dimension I will try to engage with. Uh, basically, engagement between Estonia and Europe, of course, understood at this point as, let's say, phasing out European communities and phasing in European Union, uh, and of course, the perspective of membership. And I would argue that basically, Estonia wasn't an easy case for the European communities. Uh, Estonia uh, had a degree of exceptionality uh, that included at least two minuses, let's say. The first one was, look at the map. Now, if you are a, a head of state and government from the old European communities member states, from, the, from actually the 12, the 15 still had to come. Well, you look at where Estonia is and you start thinking, okay, look, first of all, let's think about Central and Eastern Europe. And then when we get to Estonia, it will take some time. So peripherality is an issue. Peripherality was an issue, and Estonia had to prove that that peripherality wasn't so much an issue in terms of integration. The second one was that unlike the other countries of Central and Eastern Europe, Estonia, along with the three Baltic states, as Eiko just mentioned during his talk, was the only one, along with Latvia and Lithuania, that lost their sovereignty as a follow-up of the Second World War, and were forcefully occupied by the Soviet Union. Now we know that most of the West didn't recognize either the Jure or de facto or both the Soviet occupation, but it was a fact that when looking at the map, Estonia, as long with Latvia and Lithuania, were in fact part, uh, also forcefully and also let's say 
taken up with violence of the Soviet Union. So walking there for the European communities, European Union was a kind of step into the incognito, I would say, in the early 90s. I would, however, say that there are three points still related to that exceptionality that made Estonia's bid for Europe possible, and in fact, the Baltic's bid for Europe possible. The first one is the interwar statehood, and in fact, brief democratic experience. So in fact, unlike, well, all the other countries forcefully or not forcefully incorporated into the Soviet Union, uh, the three Baltic republics had a very lively interwar statehood where part of the League of Nations were contributing to the uh, political uh, debate uh, of the interwar period. And in fact, they were also very active in discussing the ideas of Europe that at that time were somehow dominating the intellectual and political debate. Uh, I would recommend to all of you who are not familiar at all with that uh, uh, to become familiar with uh, documents such as the Brian Memorandum, uh, Pan Europa, or even the European Custom Union uh, of the interwar period. And you will see that so much that is discussed there is relevant today. Uh, and uh, if you look basically at uh, the activism of Estonia and of Estonia's government during the interwar period, you would see that uh, Foreign Minister Pusta, uh, Prime Minister Tennyson were actually fairly active in discussing how to integrate uh, Euro, how to integrate Estonia into a united Europe. Uh, and in fact, very interesting, strongly connecting that to a democratic liberal worldview, somehow uh, protecting the country, again, a small country surrounded by, let's say, not necessarily so friendly powers that we will see, so, but also ideologically from fascism after Nazism and communism. Uh, and here we see, again, topics that will become relevant also after. So first of all, clearly, uh, security. Uh, Pan-Europa becomes relevant for that. Uh, the Brion Memorandum becomes relevant for that. Identity. Again, as a small nation emerged out of the ashes of the uh, Tsarist Russia and of the, of the end of the war, Estonia wanted to stress its identity as European. And also, of course, culture. There is a very interesting uh, statement by Tennyson in which he proposes somehow uh, that the, uh, the Brion Memorandum will develop a commission for governments to use newspapers, education, movies, and radio to promote the idea of European unification. We also know, however, that as democracy somehow veined in Estonia, also this debate became much more sterile and it went out of the map. But again, this brief democratic experience and this a bit longer uh, interwar statehood is one of the points of exceptionality of the Estonian case. Um, the second one is the, what followed up after the occupation, Soviet occupation, uh, the first Soviet occupation, the arrival of the German troops, and the second Soviet occupation. Well, in fact, uh, Estonia, as we know, was incorporated and annexed to the Soviet Union. But we know that the Western powers, also, of course, in the environment of the Cold War, uh, and given also the tension of the Cold War, did not recognize, for most of them, there were some exceptions that we we're discussing today, uh, the Soviet occupation of the Baltic states, in line with the West Declaration, but also this brought a couple of things related to the internal dynamic, state continuity, so Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania had governments in exile, so this somehow is an exceptionality that played the role. And again, this continuity was also recognized by most of the states that then in the 90s, we have to assess Estonia's European ambition. The last point that I would make related to the before, let's say, Maastricht times, uh, is that in fact, from day one of re-independence, I would even say from day minus one, the Estonian elites knew where they wanted to go. They wanted to go to Europe, meaning European integration, and they wanted to go to transatlantic integration. And that was very clear. So I would say that the exceptionality, the minus points of the exceptionality, peripherality and former Soviet Union were clearly outshadowed by these three points. Existence of Estonia during uh, the interwar period, existence 
if not de facto at least the jure and recognized by the partners and clear consensus on the elites now i would just spend the last five minutes to look at what happens after um so what we have is uh the first activism comes in the 80s when in fact the european parliament uh becomes fairly vocal following in fact the baltic appeal and asks for the uh estonian latvian lithuanian independence to be uh um well to be to a certain degree recognized or at least discussed at the european level interestingly by the way that they invite the ministers uh, of the European Community to propose the discussion in the decolonization subcommittee of the UN, which means that the Soviet occupation was basically Soviet colonization. Um, but then basically after the end of the Cold War, we see that in general, there is a strong support for Estonia's independence. Uh, there is, however, from the partners, not too much willingness to take too many proactive steps in that direction, since there is a fear to undermine the reforms in Russia, there is a fear somehow to antagonize the newly fairly weak Russian Federation and President Yeltsin. And um, I would like to, uh, to, to, uh, to mention a couple of points that uh, starts in this 90s. First of all, in 1992, Estonia gains the most favored nation status uh, by the European community. Um, and they the, uh, uh, express the hope that after the first step, a further step associate membership to the European community would then bring to the full membership of the EU. This is what the Estonian elites were hoping for. On the other hand, what we see is that from the sides of the European communities and union, there is much more, let's say, caution. And this is basically a document from the European Commission, which in fact is out of the consensus of the member states, so the forthcoming enlargement of the European Union, and here we are talking about 1995 to Finland, Sweden, and Austria, and the move towards closer relations with the countries of the Baltic region creates a need for the overall union policy of the region, integrating the Baltic into the world and approaching it to European integration uh, as soon as possible is relevant to us. So the point is that here it's, we hear a voice, which is very similar to what we hear today about the candidates to Western bankers. Yeah, look, yes, we recognize your European aspiration, but let's not rush. Um, and we also see that uh, we comes finally in 1993, uh, the uh, association agreement, something again comparable to the process that today the candidate countries um, countries uh, face. And after many years apart, this is basically the 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 the, co the the quote of the commission the moment symbolized the return of the baltic states to the european family but the, however did not talk about integration and the return of the baltic states into uh, a more uh, apt uh, framework which is the one of the membership this happens only in 1996 uh, and i will conclude with three quotes one from margaret thatcher one from lord mayor that followed Thatcher as he resigned, and the other one from Mitterrand. And these three quotes basically can tell us why in the early 90s, the communities weren't overly proactive in terms of integration. The communities were divided on how to proceed with the enlargement. The first one by Thatcher says, the community should declare unequivocally that it is ready to accept all the countries of Eastern Europe, including the Baltic states, as members if they want to join, provided that democracy has taken root and that their economies are capable of sustaining membership. We cannot say in one brief that they are part of Europe and in the next, uh, our European community club is so exclusive that we will not admit them. I mean, again, we know that this has been traditionally also a, uh, a kind of, um, leitmotiv of the British approach to European integration. No, the more we are, uh, the less deeper integration we get, because of course, uh, finding an agreement in, small, in a larger group is more complicated. But this is clearly, again, a clear message to opening an integration. The, the, the same uh, narrative follows with major. If we fail to bring the democratic countries of Eastern Europe, Central Europe, and the Baltic states into our community, we risk recreating divisions in Europe between haves and have-nots. Without it, 
we will risk turmoil among neighbors in Eastern and Central Europe and endanger our long-term prosperity and stability. So it also affects us. And I will finish with Mitterrand, 1989. Uh, and here we see a very different perspective, which can still like reflect this idea of, shall we first deepen or shall we first widen? But here is what Mitterrand says, seen from the West. So he admits a fairly West-centric perspective. It is urgent to reinforce the structure of the European community, so deepen. We proceed from the assumption that each people has the right to choose to solve its own problems of independence and its own interests, but also taking into account the interests of other countries like us, old Europe. Uh, and of course, the Germans, as we were saying today with uh, Heiko, as we were preparing for this session, had other things to do, to, uh, to think about in the early 90s. And I think that with this, I will probably stop here. Thank you, Stefano, for opening our uh, uh, panel uh, discussion to interesting concepts like uh, exceptionality or this post-colonial flavor that you added a little bit. And even this, you know, language games that was a part of your final, you know, uh, juxtaposition of three quotations. I think it uh, definitely something that uh, we, uh, we can discuss further. So, uh, David. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, I will not, in fact, be speaking about my, um, uh, but the foreign Estonian community in particular today, though I might just introduce myself as I'm, I'm a member of this community. In fact, the, my mother was born in the very building where uh, we are right now, uh, uh, though I grew up and spent most of my life in the United States. But what I want to, um, well, I guess my, my remarks here are going to be to try to uh, set the question of Estonian independence, uh, the Singing Revolution, in a broad European context, um, and actually a context that is as much chronologically uh, broad uh, as it is spatially or geographically. Uh, Stefano and Heiko have already sort of alluded to Estonia's exceptional place in kind of the history of Europe, uh, its peripheral position, its loss of sovereignty in the 19, um, uh, through the Soviet Union, uh, and its place kind of in a larger maybe story of decolonization or, uh, and, and removing uh, imperial powers from the world. Uh, I want to call attention to perhaps the way in which uh, the very question of Europe uh, that I think we are debating here in a broader sense is also uh, apparent or visible in the case of Estonia, how the Estonian predicament is maybe not only exceptional, but typical in some ways of the struggle to become European in a democratic sense over the course of the long durée. Uh, 1989, the year that we're taking kind of as our starting point here, I'll remind you, is also the bicentennial of the French Revolution, uh, 1789. So the question of, uh, of, the, of the French Revolution and what the French Revolution means to Europe and to the world uh, was very much present all around the world in that, in that year. Uh, as a small country, uh, well, it's often said, that actually, the Catalan French historian remarked that the history of the world is best seen from the frontier. Uh, and Estonia, of course, occupies such a frontier, a frontier East, was uh, the Eastern frontier. It is the Eastern frontier of the European Union. It was the Western frontier of the Soviet Union. Uh, and as a post-Soviet country, now firmly in the grips of the European Union, we can say it is a good place from which to look both east and west, both into the future, but also into the past. Uh, and as a small country, a post-Soviet country uh, that has throughout most of its history been in the grips of large empires and foreign powers, this is where I think we can find sort of Estonia's relevance to Europe uh, and the European story at large. Indeed, uh, the democratic promise, but also the problem of Europe emerges already in ancient Athens to take us a, a long way back into the past. So from what do we get from ancient Athens for democracy, for the ideal of democracy that we're discussing in this event today? The idea of citizenship, the idea of participation, the value of dialogue, the value of debate, the agora itself, public assembly, but at the same time, the recognition that most Athenians were not citizens, that only uh, basically a third of its 300,000 inhabitants uh, were in fact citizens, and only about 30,000 of those had voting rights as, as male uh, citizens. And, uh, and along with all the non-citizens, there were about 80,000 slaves in ancient Athens as well. 
democracy has been plagued, in other words, from the start with the sense that it is not truly democratic. And that within the context of the aspiration to democracy, there's always been the presence of forms of power, forms of government that don't seem to answer to that ideal. But the problem of ancient Athens was not only a problem of the domestic community, it was also a problem of foreign policy, one might say. And this is something that is also relevant to the European predicament today and Estonia's place in the European Union today. In his famous uh, uh, history of the Peloponnesian War, the Greek historian Thucydides included a fascinating dialogue called the Malian Dialogue, which is really about the Athenian attitude towards the small island of Melos in the Aegean Sea. The Athenians were upset that the Malians had not really conformed to their place in the alliance. They weren't playing, they weren't good members of the empire and came to them oh, with a statement or with the- um, Ready to connect. And, and came to them with the, came to them with the, uh, uh, with, with the uh, argument that um, uh, they should, they would be forced into slavery or they would be put to death. The Malians said, please don't, but the, Malian, but the Athenians retorted, Athenians, the inventors of democracy, that in this world, we live in a world in which the strong do as they will, but the weak suffer what they must. This is sometimes taken as the founding statement of international relations, the founding statement of political science, founding statement of perhaps our sense of how the world works, of political realism. The notion that there is all, only in this world a world a power, that notions of justice are always victor's justice. It's the winners who write the rules of history. Now, the challenge of Europe, I would say, is can we find an answer to the Malian dialogue? Can we find an answer or a retort to the Athenian position? Can we find a way in which we can create a world, transform the world in such a way that might no longer makes right but right makes might. That justice and democracy become a power in their own right and can dictate the terms of the arrangements by which we organize human affairs. In some sense, that's the long story, I would say. That's the Malian question, which is also the Estonian question uh, in the Malian dialogue and in the, to, the European, uh, to the European problem. Is there a role for the small powers, for the small voices, for the people who are lost, who are weak, to actually have a place in an international global dialogue where it isn't just the powerful who determine what happens. That is the democratic dream of Europe, I would say. And it's this kind of idea of Europe uh, and the, this promise of Europe that became especially powerful in the 18th century and thereafter. Democracy, uh, you could say, as, as the promise of the rule of the people and also the inclusion of those who are weakest and less ab least able to stand up with weapons or with some form of power for their own rights as the hope of Europe has really been articulated since uh, 1919, since uh, the formation of the League of Nations, since the conclusion of the First World War, in terms of three other values. You might sort of think about how these values are, are, are fundamental to the European Union today. We, when we speak of democracy, we are not speaking of democracy simply as the rule of the people. We're speaking of liberal, parliamentary, and constitutional democracy. Liberal, why liberal? Liberal because we are speaking about individual rights and the rule of law. Why parliamentary? Because we ultimately have decided that direct democracies don't really work and we need representational forms in order to make democracy function. Why constitutional? Because unless we have a code of laws or a basis for a code of laws, what is the source or how can we, how can we formalize our legitimacy? So it's, It'd be worth sort of thinking about what, how, to what extent the European Union, the ideal of democracy we're imagining is not just democracy, it's a liberal parliamentary constitutional democracy, and how it is the plight in some sense of small countries like Estonian, like the Malians, the Malian dialogue, that have given rise to this ideal. I would like to wrap things up, really, uh, or conclude my statement simply by, by um, calling attention to three different, uh, say, uh, problems that I hope you will consider in the debates of the day and tomorrow, and which I think ultimately, from the perspective of small countries, and uh, the perspective of a world in which, you, which uh, might no longer make right, right, but right makes might, which have to be taken into account 
uh, in any attempt to make, make the world more democratic. And three words, these are development, revolution, and nation. The first, development. The story of Europe, really since the 18th century, has been told in terms of two revolutions, and two revolutions that are really all about development and democracy, and how those two things are together, and how problematic they can sometimes work against. The French Revolution is many ways seen as the first and most fundamental democratic revolution. A revolution about politics, a revolution about giving people uh, more voice, but it's parallel, at least in the words of the famous historian Eric Hobsbawm, with the industrial revolution, a revolution in development. And the problem of question of how can we extend the voice to all the people in the world, to the smallest, to the millions, to the Estonians, if we don't have development at the same time? Development, in some sense, is a prerequisite and also a problematic problem to democracy. Time and again, since the French Revolution, we see the difficulties of getting development and democracy together. It seems the regimes that are most able to develop are often the least democratic, or it's democratic regimes when they stop being democratic that they become the most capable of development. A case in point, France, under the rule of Napoleon III, uh, declares the, French, uh, the Second Empire uh, in the middle of the 19th century, kind of ending the democratic aspirations of the Second French Revolution. But there are numerous other examples. Bismarck's Germany, much more successful at development than the democratic states around. So how can dem democracy and development go together is one of the great problems facing, uh, facing the modern world and the facing meaningful democracy in the world today. The second point I wanted to bring up here was uh, that of revolution. Really the story of Europe since the 18th century has been very much a story of revolution. 1848 uh, was a date in the uh, history of the French Revolution, in the history of European Revolution, that is foundation. Uh, 1848 was called the springtime of the peoples, the moment when most of the people of Europe try, rise up against the powers that are dominating them and try to find a voice of their own. But to what extent can we create democracy without the violence of revolution? Is there a revolution without violence? The singing revolution in Estonia, is sometimes or often taken as an example of this. But it's in the 1848, in this moment of pan-European revolution as well, that we see Victor Hugo's call for, at the Paris Peace Conference, for a united Europe. A day will come, he said then, when you France, you Russia, you Italy, you England, you Germany, you all nations of the continent, without losing your distinct qualities and your glorious individuality, will be merged closely within a superior unit, and you will form the European Brotherhood just as Normandy, Brittany, Burgundy, Lorraine, and Alsace and all our provinces are merged together in France. A day will come when the only fields of battle will be markets opening up to trade and mines opening up to ideas. A day will come when the bullets and the bombs will be, re will be replaced by votes, by the universal suffrage of the peoples, by the venerable attribution of a great sovereign senate, which will be to Europe what this parliament is to England, what this diet is to Germany, and what this legislative assembly is to France. In the throes of the revolution of 1848, Victor Hugo hoped for, imagined a better, more peaceful Europe. But the story of getting there has been marked with enormous violence. And in many ways, and in many cases, we say we couldn't have gotten there without violence. So that's the second large problem I ask you to consider with democracy. Can demo democratic states be established? Can decolonization happen without some degree of violence? The last point, the point about nationhood and nation and the nation state in its relationship to democracy is perhaps um, also a, a reminder of the ideal of the liberal parliamentary constitutional regimes that were established in 1919 because it is also in 1919 that the ideal of national self-determination is articulated as the fundamental prerequisite in some sense for any kind of meaningful democracy. Along with that notion is, of course, the notion that democratic nation states have to be merged into a confederation, whether at first the League of Nations, later the United Nations, the uh, yeah, European Union might be seen in this light as well. But there's always this kind of balance in transforming a world order that was based upon empire into a world order based on nation states. 
in creating nation states that are also coordinated among themselves. So the third problem I'm asking you to sort of think about here is the problem of the nation and the extent to which the nation is in danger always within its confederation of being subsumed within that confederation and, uh, as a kind of imperial subject, suffering the fate of the Malians. This was certainly something that was brought up over the course of the last decade in regard to the European Union when there was discussion of a democratic deficit in the European Union. The extent to which in, uh, the, 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 the criticism and the kind of standards imposed upon Greece, austerity measures, were not democratically accepted by the people of Greece. So I would sort of leave you with these, uh, well, well, leave you with three kind of, uh, again, three problems that are associated with the national vision of democracy that uh, Europe has subscribed to in some sense ever since 1919, if not ever since 1789. And the first is the one I just mentioned, the problem of a kind of creeping authoritarianism. The notion that nation states in participating in a global system or in a European wide system are always subject to authorities outside themselves and can't really represent the wishes of the people that referendums taken on the part of the Greeks can never be given any meaningful power. So authoritarianism is one problem. Second problem is the opposite, anarchy. Too many voices always speaking at once. Any meaningful democracy and any meaningful, I think, initiative for, uh, for developing a more democratic European Union, and your projects would probably have to wrestle with this problem too, is how to deal with the problem of anarchy. How can, how can you create a system that has a kind of unity, not an authoritarian unity, that was the other danger, but where the voices are saying different things, so many different things, that nothing gets done, nothing can be done. And the last and third problem, uh, problem I think that I want to, this is what I will leave you with, is a problem that really became most prominent and maybe apparent over the course of the last decade, and that is the question of populism. What if we do manage to avoid the problems of authoritarianism and the problems of anarchy. Authoritarianism from the outside and the problem of, uh, of anarchy from within. But what if the people, when we actually listen to their voice, want something that we don't want them to want? What if the people want genocide? What if the people want something to do harm to their neighbor? What if the authentic voice of the people seems to be a voice that is democratic, but against every other human value that we hold dear to our hearts. That is perhaps the third problem in the context of, I think, the nation state that we must confront when dealing with the question and the values of democracy. So my short presentation to you today, I've given you a few different ways of thinking about the problem of democracy uh, and as seen from the perspective of Estonia as a pan-European problem, the problem of defending the rights and the, uh, of, of the weakest, those who are least able to stand up for themselves. The question of can we transform a world of empires where uh, might makes right into a world where right makes might. And if in that process of transforming that world, we can wrestle with, deal with uh, the questions of development, of democracy, and of the nation. Thank you, David, for completing uh, our picture with uh, your uh, historical and uh, I would say theoretical kind of immersions into uh, into the topic. And uh, now I think it's time for uh, opening up our uh, triangle to, uh, well, as far as I know, several dozens of uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, we have, uh, well, quite a lot of time for that. Uh, so uh the q a session has already started you are kindly welcome to either uh, ask your questions or somehow engage with our uh, discussion uh, through your voice or you can use the chat uh, option as well if there's something in the chat uh, perhaps we can start with that if not uh, you can raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll see that uh, you want to uh, you want to say something for uh, for this discussion? Yeah. Then okay. Then say and yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, so we have some already some kind of feedback or some reactions or comments. Uh, can anyone hear me through the catch box or the sound is not very good? It's good, yeah? Okay, I'm mostly asking about the online participants because there were some issues with the sound. Uh, if it's possible, I just want to kind of abuse my role of semi-organizer of the event. Uh, and first of all, thank the speakers uh, for a very interesting uh, kind of input. Uh, I think a lot has been said when it comes to kind of main factors that led to eventually re-independence of Baltic states, but I also wanted to ask maybe to a little bit comment about the role of, for example, Estonian government in exile and um, the, the, let's say the Estonian and Latvian uh, and Lithuanian communities living abroad, how much of a role they also played in kind of keeping this idea and identity uh, alive among the, the younger generation. So, uh, I don't know to whom exactly to address the question, but uh, just, yeah, maybe to start with that. Thank you. As a member of that community. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I didn't, uh, this got left, well, it was only left out of the, my talk, but but it was part a big part of my identity, at least personally. The very fact that I'm here is in some sense uh, coming to look for roots, and it's maybe the, you could say credit to my mother for having instilled in me a kind of a sufficiently a sense of Estonianness for this to mean something to me, for me to want to uh, be part of uh, a kind of Estonian uh, community and and to participate in its uh, in, in the story of of the Estonian nation state and how it uh, is becoming uh, or returning to Europe. But uh, I think the diaspora communities, uh, this is a kind of an interesting feature, I think, of the 20th century is that uh, because uh, we think of the 20th century is, a, is the century of national self-determination, but it's also the century of the loss of nationhood for a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, Baltic states are in some sense typical. And, and another way in which I think Estonia is typical is it's uh, a century of diasporas, that there aren't that many uh, communities with a very significant diaspora uh, before the 20th century. At the end of the 20th century, almost every community, almost every nation has, its, has a major diaspora. And one way in which that's made the, uh, the, maybe the return to Europe or the, the, uh, for European countries at least difficult is it's created at least a double discourse. I think there's always been a sense of a divide between those who are abroad and claim to speak for the nation and those who are at home. Uh, in many ways, uh, the danger of my position or the, the expatriate uh, Estonian is, uh, and maybe this was more prominent in the 1990s, was somebody who tries to, uh, comes back to the benighted uh, to the natives of the country and tries to teach them how to how to build democracy. I have actually a very good Latvian friend who really wrote a book on this topic uh, as it applies to Latvia, uh, Datsin Sinovska, in her book on School of Europeanness. It was really about the tolerance initiatives that came to Latvia in the mid 1990s as people, well, the equivalent of me <laughs> in Latvia, uh, it's for foreign Latvians, but, but not just foreign Latvians, NGOs, liberal representatives of Europe came back to Latvia and tried to teach them what it meant to be a good European. And how that, in fact, tried, in some sense, exacerbated the problem that it was supposed to solve. So the role of the diaspora, I think, is, is really a twofold one. This is the negative side. I mean, the positive side is that there are some very remarkable people, and maybe, in some sense, the founding figure of our institute, uh, 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 Reint Atagetera, uh, was a good example, who kind of reoriented the social sciences in Estonia, uh, created a new basis. Uh, for social science and for the uh, in and for this institute that presently exists, uh, and was able to sort of think outside of the box of the Soviet inheritance. But uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll let somebody else sort of join them. Maybe hey, go on to say something. <laughs> uh, thank you. I think it's it's very com complex question <laughs> and a little bit with this kind of Pandora box. Uh, on one hand. Uh, I, I think that um, without these exile communities, uh, the, the question of continuity, uh, non-recognition by, by Western countries of, of the Soviet occupation and recognition of Soviet occupation, that uh, 
probably wouldn't happen. Uh, yes, we may say that how exactly in the legal details that the question of, of continuity or, or, or how legal this um, Excel governments were, uh, but uh, but certainly they represented Estonian, talking about the Estonian Excel government, that, that they represented the Estonian government. They were also taken by uh, at least Western nations as representatives of, of Estonian government. Uh, their um, uh, existence uh, kept, particularly in North America, uh, the, the issue constantly up and uh, the moment of uh, so-called honeymoon during the Cold War, uh, when the Helsinki process was taking place and, uh, and the post-World War II borders were agreed uh, as, as the existing one in, in, in Europe, then uh, the exile Pol's uh, protest enforced at least American president to say that except the Baltic states. So that uh, it clearly showed that it was the moment when everybody said, okay, yeah, it's past what happened. Let's move on. Let's look for the bright future and so on. But no, actually this initiative uh, kept this alive. And uh, and certainly also, I think these connections, as little they, they were possible during during the Cold War uh, between the uh, Excel Estonians and those Estonians uh, who were living here, uh, they, as I already mentioned before, they were the window uh, to uh, beyond the, the Iron Curtain. Uh, I know one of my, my colleagues told um, the the story uh, that um, she also had uh, the family members uh, 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 abroad as a part of ex uh, Estonian community, and uh, and she described that it was the, the mid eighties when uh, her husband was working uh, as a Soviet scientist uh, in in the UK. And uh, before the wives were sent to their, their husbands to the UK, uh, they had this kind of uh, ideological training uh, that uh, the, the wives will, won't be uh, surprised to see uh, the, the West, that the, how terrible and how dangerous the West is, and then how actually is everything is show off and then nothing is real, what to see there and then so on. And, and she said that she, of course, wasn't so naive <laughs> and, and, and she knew what, what the West is. Uh, but at the same time, there were people from uh, Siberia or from the uh, areas of the Soviet Union where they didn't have any connection with, with, with the West. And they took everything as granted, everything what these trainers uh, told them. And I think that this is, even though this is this kind of anecdotal situation, but uh, but this I think this shows that uh, how how important this connection uh, was. On the other hand, maybe on this kind of negative <laughs> side, that's why as I said that this is this kind of Pandora box. It's not uh, everything so so rosy. Uh, there was definitely also this um, this competition. And then this this struggle that who is the, the true Estonian? Because among the Excel Estonians, those who stayed here, they were seen that they are kind of collaborators. They did not fight against the, the Soviet regime. They went along and then they kind of distorted the nationhood. Uh, and clearly this Estonianness that was kept alive uh, beyond the Iron Curtain, it was, it evolved different way how Estonian has evolved uh, in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and then, the, for example, in the Soviet Union, you couldn't even read the, the exile Estonian authors, so that this, this even the cultural exchange was very much limited. Uh, and the, the Estonians here, they saw exile Estonians as a traitor, so that, come on, we had to suffer everything here and you just took the boat and went away. So <laughs> what you are complaining? 
and and this this was very much in in, in the 90s uh, and um, on the one hand yes the experiences that that you described that yes someone uh, from from the west from from other european countries uh, estonian community was very large in, in sweden uh, but also in the north america uh, they came here we had this ex experience uh, democrats we can say <laughs> uh, who came here to to teach but this teaching was not always well taken because it was like the who you are that you come here and tell us that we have been all the time wrong <laughs> that we are not the true estonians uh, and yeah we also saw some people who really came with a mission as you mentioned Jane Dagger, who established the social sciences in estonia and then and so on uh, but we also saw this kind of uh, adventurers uh, who try to say that okay you don't know anything uh, how to live in the proper democratic society now i come and show you but actually these people were kind of charlatans <laughs> uh, they didn't have any proper background even to provide this ex expertise here but they played on that that okay i'm coming from from the west from from the democratic society and then uh, i will benefit i get uh, some kind of salaries and so on so that in that sense this this story has been very uh, very very complex i think today we have more or less reached to kind of common ground it's not yeah balance it's it's not anymore the, the question that who is the traitor and then who is the collaborant it's is is certainly not uh, not a lie but but it it was in in uh in in the 90s and and uh, and this kind of envy and then this this kind of uh or stupidity saying that how stupid are these post-soviet people here <laughs> don't understand anything how, how proper society functions so it, it, it was all, all here so i think it's a little bit similar uh with the, with the german experience mm -hmm. that uh, when the west germans came to, to east germany and they started to teach east germans how to be a proper proper people uh, human human beings so that this this uh things definitely is, is there but certainly we can't deny that there has been also their merit in, in, in this, this process, a very important role, which very often is kind of neglected or forgotten when, when our history books are written. That, that's actually also what hap was happening uh, beyond the Cold War, not everything on, on our, our soil. Yeah. Yeah. I have a strong feeling that our conversation becomes more and more interesting. <laughs> Uh, anything yeah. to add, or shall we uh, go to? Well, maybe I just have a word to say. I mean, not as uh, an expatriate Estonian or as someone who stayed here during the occupation, but but uh, two considerations on what already Heiko and David kind of you know discussed quite extensively. The first one is this balance, and I believe that you know if we talk about one of the positive influences of European integration and simply again not only European integration but Europeanization opening up. Well, I think that again, again, European integration, becoming a member of the EU, opening up not only the borders of, of the land, but also the borders somehow of interaction and having a more complex and multi-layered society, which is in a way one of the impacts of, again, European integration and so on has helped this process of balancing. Because again, then after all, it wasn't just, let's say, the one who left Estonia after the Soviet occupation the one who stayed Estonia and, some, and somehow faced the Soviet occupation or the one that within the Soviet Union migrated to Estonia during the Soviet occupation. But then there was so much more diversity. And in a way that more diversity, that more like uh, uh, complication in, 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 in how a society challenges itself has made easier for, again, this kind of cleavages to become uh, easier to accept. But when it comes again to the, um, to the two things, again, the fact that Estonia managed to have a government in exile, managed to have representations, managed to have legations, and that also there was a vibrant diaspora living outside of Estonia. Well, even when we look at uh, this document, I was referring it today, this European Parliament resolution regarding the Baltic states and even a previous one, uh, which was uh, of a couple of years earlier, uh, in which it was about the situation in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. This was uh, by the, uh, the Council. What we see is that there is a reference clearly on the uh, diaspora living abroad, 
on, on the fact that somehow part of the country has been forced to leave and other has been somehow uh, turned into prisoners inside the same alleged polity that was, uh, according to the Soviet, the home of Estonia. And, and again, we see that uh, uh, mentioned here. And we also, of course, see all the mention of self-determination, independence, which was one of the key ro fundamental roles to keep that, uh, that flame alive of delegations, of, of the government in exile, and most of all of the people that in free societies were able somehow to counterbalance certain narratives uh, that were coming from uh, not only beyond the Iron Curtain, but also from certain sectors of, let's say, the European left, or somehow from certain sectors simply weren't aware of, of the Baltic states' existence. So keeping the flame alive was important not only for within Estonia, but was also important for what happened in the European circle, and I would even say, let's say, at global level. I can see from here there is a question to Mr. Mr. Stefano I and can, some other. <laughs> yeah, I, I can also take uh, some, some questions. Uh, actually, one of the questions that was a little bit upper, and uh, it's my bad I haven't seen it. Uh, basically, maybe we can take just two two questions and then address to the panel. So one of them is related kind of, was there an Estonian armed forces on the eve of the Soviet windrow? And uh, another one is, yes, uh, addressed to Stefano, but I believe probably all of the panelists can comment on that. Uh, so basically the question is related uh, to more kind of cultural dimension in your opinion, uh, what from the Soviet culture still exists uh, nowadays in uh, Estonian society and uh, perhaps what elements feel uh, uh, well, people feel, feel nostalgic or even maybe proud of, and to uh, and um, what do you think the Soviet time, how the Soviet ch time changed uh, Estonian identity or culture? Directly, so you can start and then you can just. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I can start from there. Of course, I could start saying that uh, one of the big heritage of Estonia's. Uh, occupation and Estonia is very proud of it. Are uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the snack that is quite popular. But let's say going back to more uh, to more relevant aspects. Well, I mean for sure, uh, uh, the Soviet occupation has left uh, very tangible cleavages in the Estonian society. Um, well, again, one of course has to do with the. Uh, uh, with the ethnic cleavage, which clearly is visible and evident, is still part very much of, of the debate in Estonia. Um, I mean, in a way, uh, uh, Estonia found itself with a large portion of, uh, uh, of Russian-speaking population that moved into the country when the country, also again, uh, illegally uh, annexed, occupied, was still part of a polity called Soviet Union. And so a relevant part uh, uh, and a tangible uh, uh, portion of the population of, of Estonia moved into the country during uh, occupied Estonia. And of course, one of the big issues was like how to deal with this population once Estonia regains the independence. And, and, and the question is tricky if you look at it from a, a perspective that is not fully aware of all the cleavages in Estonia. In fact, it's complex also for Estonia itself. Because Regardless of the fact that Estonia was illegally or not illegally annexed, of course, it was illegally occupied by the Soviet Union. Well, these people moved inside a, a, a union and they were citizens, in fact, of the same union and they moved to Estonia. And, and when Estonia regained its, in, its independence, well, clearly many of these people felt this is my home. And at the same time, because of the state continuity, because of the fact that Estonia was occupied, but neither de facto nor de jure, in fact, uh, incorporated into the Soviet Union, Estonian government, which in fact inherited its, its, uh, its, um, its legitimacy out of the government in exile, well, had the right to decide what to do with its polity and somehow how to deal with citizenship. So this is clearly one issue which has been on the table for a long time. Uh, in the 90s, it has been a very, heavy issue. Clearly, in fact, European integration has played a role to kind of, you know, facilitate a, a, a more relaxed access to citizenship, which is still, however, based, in fact, on uh, um, 
on a, 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 a language exam in terms of uh, naturalization. Uh, but also in terms, for example, of um, other experts that we were discussing. Uh, I mean, clearly, the very strong determination to return to Europe, the very strong determination to uh, be reintegrated into the, uh, into, the, into the core of European nation, and in fact of um, moving towards the, trans, uh, the transatlantic alliance, that was a, 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 an outcome, somehow a reaction to the Soviet occupation. Uh, and of course, let, let, let's also uh, be frank, sometimes um, some of the political issues that emerged pretty much in every vibrant liberal democratic society have been put under the carpet by, uh, uh, by, by some politician and some political elites with the excuse that this is because of the Soviet occupation. So sometimes issues which in fact weren't directly related to Soviet occupation uh, were somehow discussed within that framework because might be politically convenient. Um, so these clearly are some aspects uh, uh, related uh, to that. Um, when it comes, of course, to uh, the uh, uh, to the the, uh, the consequences of, of that occupation, well, again, we can see, for example, the '90s, the political, uh, the, the political and economic situation. I mean, the transition that was very much an outcome of, of, of the dramatic uh, situation of, of the late years of the uh, of the Soviet period, and how Estonia somehow tried to reemerge from that. Um, and, and in that sense, of course, uh, um, a, a vibrant diaspora that has returned into Estonia has managed somehow to uh, move the country far enough and, and fast enough away, in fact, from the traditional problems faced by a number of post-Soviet societies. And the same, not only related to the diaspora, but also somehow to the determination of the uh, political elites um, when it comes again to, uh, the, uh, to the direction that the country would have taken. So I would say that these are some of the points that I would have, uh, that I would highlight when it comes to this. Okay. No. Sure. Uh, so did I understand correctly? The first question was about armed forces, right? Yeah, no, it, uh, there were a lot of soldiers <laughs> in, in, in Estonia on uh, the eve of uh, independence, but they were Soviet soldiers. And the Soviet army was uh, actually, this was one of the main sources, of, uh, of the, one of the two main sources of immigration during the Soviet period. There were uh, the soldiers and their, and their families, and then there were laborers. The laborers were the, uh, were, were the most prominent. But even here in Tartu, we had uh, an important uh, 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 well, airfield, a secret airfield on the western frontier of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think it was the largest uh, fleet of nuclear bombers uh, on the western frontier, uh, presided over at the end of the 1980s by the future president, uh, short-lived president of Chechnya, uh, the uh, Jokhar Dudayev, who has a plaque commemorating his, his time here in uh, Estonia, here in Tartu. But um, but there was uh, uh, the military presence was uh, was entirely uh, a, a Soviet one, and there was a fear too that it would become a factor. I think in hampering the transition uh, to uh, independence, uh, there was a, there was a, there were resistance fighters uh, known as the Forest Brothers or the Forest Brethren in all three of the Baltic states. Uh, and this was really a movement that was most powerful and strongest in Lithuania, but significant in Estonia as well. Uh, up until the 1950s, at least, there were several of these uh, sort of, uh, you could say, partisan uh, fighters who were uh, opposing, actively opposing uh, Soviet occupation and the takeover. And as I said, in Lithuania, I think they were the most successful, even holding several villages for, for a long period. And I think the last of the, of the in Estonian, we call them the, the Metsavennat, were uh, apprehended uh, well, very late, I think in the 1970s or something. But, um, but this is the part of at least the, um, of the history and, and the mythology as well of, of, of resistance to uh, occupation. But um, for the other questions about, um, uh, these are good questions, I think, in, uh, what the Soviet culture, is, what, what from Soviet culture still exists uh, today in Estonia. And I would say an awful lot, although very little of it is emphasized or brought out. 
Uh, most of the, there are plenty of Soviet monuments that still exist, uh, and they are, some of them are recognized and commemorated mostly by the Russian speaking community. Uh, World War II monuments, uh, there's one here uh, near the, uh, well, actually near the National Museum now, <laughs> uh, which I think on May 9th, it will have a, a significant contingent of mostly Russian speaking uh, 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 people sort of uh, bringing flowers to it. Uh, there are, there was a famous monument, uh, which became the subject of, of a great, uh, you could say a lot of uh, uh, discussion and uh, a riot even in 2007, known as the Bronze Soldier. Uh, this was a monument built in Tallinn uh, right after the, uh, in 1945 or 1946 to commemorate the liberation of Tallinn from the Nazis by the Red Army. Uh, and this, uh, became a kind of, it's interesting that it was a monument that was allowed to stand after 1990, 1991. Nobody seemed to really care about it all that much. But in the early 2000s, right around the time of Estonia's accession to the EU and to NATO, it became uh, an intense uh, you could say symbol of, of two contrasting views of the world. And there were, uh, it seemed that the, the Russian minority in Estonia used this monument really to, uh, again, for May Day, Victory Day celebrations, uh, commemorating the Soviet Victory Day, bringing the monument flowers, Estonians, there were, it got plastered with graffiti a few times, and the, and the uh, prime minister, Andrew Sansit, decided then to remove it to a nearby sort of cemetery for monuments of, 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 of the defunct regime which provoked these riots then, uh, in the course of which I believe only one person was killed, apparently trampled to death by other rioters, but, 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 it, it, but it speaks to the semiotic or, 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 or significance of the, uh, of the way in which perhaps the Soviet past is significant in Estonia today, which may help to answer your question more broadly. And this is what I think was fascinating about it. There are long periods of time, years, decades, even when nobody notices these monuments and all of a sudden they become semiotically significant, I think very powerful, uh, as the bronze soldier did in 2005, six and seven. And then there were, was- ah, question, I think, now you can, if there are some- oh, I'm questions. just looking at the, the questions, the last question uh, to- oh. Otherwise we become blind oh, okay. if we read them. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, and I, good question. Is there anything from the Soviet era the Estonians are proud of? Uh, I, I might actually let Heiko answer that question. Uh, uh, and what do you think uh, the Soviet time changed in the Estonian identity or culture? That too, I think, is, is probably significant. Um, and let me throw out some ideas and see what Heiko has to say about, about these. Anna Vesky and Denis Magyar. Yeah. Anna Vesky and Denis So you have some pop stars, uh, singers. There's a question, though, maybe about alcoholism, whether alcohol and the, and the drinking of a vodka was... Uh, how much this was a Soviet legacy, um, or uh, whether um, sort of other aspects, uh, was the, sort of the negative aspects uh, of, of, of society that are often associated with uh, the Soviet era, for example, passivity, or a kind of a reluctance to speak out in public or to show your true colors. Uh, and I actually would wonder what Heiko would have to say about that. Okay, so I, I tried then also to, to comment some, some of these, these questions. Uh, about this uh, Estonian army when the Soviet Union was, was redrawing, uh, then uh, definitely there wasn't army as, as the Red Army or, or, or then uh, that became Russian army, similar like that. But when Estonia was restoring its, uh, its independence, uh, the Estonian uh, Republic, which still wasn't fully uh, uh, up, away from, uh, from the Soviet Union, uh, then uh, there was need for, for this kind of uh, civil uh, uh, institutions as, as a porter card and, and, uh, and then the police. Uh, and of course, they were clearly poorly equipped to compare with 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 a, a so Soviet uh, army. And then, yes, there were even this kind of uh, small incidents on on the border because it was also their aim of 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 the imperialist forces to show that they do not respect the the local government, uh, the 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 shooting of of Estonian border guards. Uh, by by the Oman uh, special Soviet uh, forces, uh, but uh, fortunately it didn't evolve into this kind of any any larger uh, war situation. 
but also the moment when the uh, Estonia already has restored independence, it has, was uh, recognized internationally, the, the, the Russian troops, they remained in Estonia until 1994. And in 1993, there was this, this kind of um, uh, difficult moment for, for Estonia. In, uh, in Northeast Estonia, Narva, Silama, the, the cities which are predominantly even today Russian speaking, uh, the, uh, some local activists, uh, they, they tried as a reaction on one hand to Estonian government uh, uh, continuity principle that kind of left these people without citizenship uh, and, and also uh, probably some influence uh, coming from, uh, from Russia uh, that uh, they claimed to, to have uh, autonomy, to make a referendum, uh, and uh, as much as the Russian troops were still in Estonia, there was this kind of fear that we will get uh, something like Transnistria in Estonia or, or, or uh, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia. Uh, and it was clearly not Estonian interest. And, and uh, as a result of, of this complicated situation, then there was negotiations with these local activists and uh, Estonian government granted uh, voting rights for, for non-citizens during uh, in the local election, municipality elections, not the national one, but that municipality election, so that they, to some extent, are involved uh, as a part of the uh, political uh, process. Uh, now, regarding to the Soviet uh, legacy in Estonia, I think that probably Stefano uh, outlined this um, uh, ethnically, which, uh, which is still uh, here, and just wanted to put this into um, more understandable perspective in, in European context, because it's very often somehow assumed, presumed that the Russians has lived here forever, and, uh, and then somehow when Estonia restored independence, it started to become, behave as, as a, some kind of uh, discriminated towards Russian minority, ethnic minority. So, of course, the question of citizenship, it's not recording to the ethnicity, but it's recording to the uh, continuity people who uh, had the citizenship before Estonia was occupied during, uh, by the Soviet Union. Uh, they doesn't matter if they are ethnic Russians, they have the same right for, for citizenship as, as uh, ethnic Estonians. And ethnic Estonians who did not have, there's also Estonians living in uh, Caucasus or, or, or Crimea, uh, they are now struggling to, to get this Estonian citizenship, also have to go through the naturalization process and so on, so that in that sense it's clearly not the ethnic, uh, ethnic base. But just to put into the uh, perspective, the uh, mass migration to Estonia, uh, it uh, takes place just let's say that maybe one it started one decade earlier as the Gastarbeiters started to arrive to, to Germany. And, uh, and I, I think that this, this puts things to, to the perspective that this is relatively recent phenomenon. If before Second World War, Estonia was relatively homogeneous. It was almost 90% of, of populations were ethnic Estonians. Then uh, in 89, when uh, it was the last uh, Soviet popular census, Estonian percent or the share of ethnic Estonians has dropped from the close to 90 to 60. So that's a 30% drop. And I think this also describes why they are this kind of fear for a small nation that they are losing their their identity and this kind of uh, protection of their identity Estonianness uh, uh, I think that's also to some extent that this Soviet legacy what what we have uh, and then also what we can see that some political forces are really trying to abuse this uh, this experience so that this na uh, national radical forces they are. Uh, when in 2015 we, we had uh, 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 migration flows to, uh, uh, from Middle East to, to, to Europe, then they are exactly using these fears and these emotions that the story.